Okay, let's talk about general interventions for a patient with increased ICP. Let's look at factors that affect intracranial pressure. First of all, blood pressure. You want to make sure your patient's normotensive. An increase in blood pressure is also going to increase intracranial pressure. Venous pressure. What does that mean? You know, there's four arteries that perfuse the brain. There's only two veins that drain it. So you want to make sure you promote venous drainage by having the head of the bed 30 degrees to promote venous outflow. An increase in intra-abdominal, intrathoracic pressure. What does that mean for us? Try to not have the patient cough too much. When we're suctioning, make sure we even blunt the gag reflex as indicated with lidocaine. Um, Colase, stool softener, so cut down on patients' use of the Valsalva maneuver when they bear down. Patient needs to be in a neutral alignment. In other words, when they start posturing and how they change position and fall all off the bed, we want to make sure we're constantly repositioning and putting them back into that neutral alignment so their body is in a straight position. Arterial blood gases. You know, carbon dioxide is a venous vasodilator. So if a patient were to get hypercapnic or hypercarb carbic, then the CO2 would cause an increase in venous vasodilation and thereby increase intracranial pressure. So definitely ventilate the patient so that the CO2 doesn't build up. Don't overventilate so that the CO2 goes too far low because that will cause a vasoconstriction. So make sure the patient is not hypoxemic, so make sure they're sufficiently oxygenated. Temperature, keep them normothermic, don't let them have a fever. This will increase intracranial pressure um, and also don't put their body temperature too low because that shivering will cause an increase in ICP. Anything that increases brain metabolism is going to increase blood flow to the brain, is going to increase ICP. So keep normothermic. Decrease stimuli to the patient if that means limiting visitors, limiting radio, TV, any kind of noise and stimuli is going to decrease intracranial pressure. From a pharmacologic standpoint, diuretics may be necessary. Mannitol in particular is what's called an osmotic diuretic. So it will decrease cerebral edema by pulling some of the fluid from the brain tissue out and the patient will diurese it out. You do have to pay attention to the serum osmolality with mannitol, normal being 275 to 295. You want to hold the mannitol if serum osmolality exceeds 320, then it's too hyperosmolar. Also, mannitol requires a filter to infuse. Lasix is also a diuretic option. Lasix will actually also decrease um, cerebral spinal fluid production, which will also decrease pressure. So Lasix will also, you know, secondarily decrease ICP. Definitely sedate, sedate, sedate. I see a lot of propofol, that anesthetic, that lipid-based anesthetic. Fentanyl for comfort as an opioid analgesic, a continuous drip. I guess you could, you know, give them, um, you know, round the clock fentanyl, but it's much more practical to have just a steady state of fentanyl induce that comfort effect. Versed and as an anxiolytic, also as a drip, just anything to decrease brain stimuli. Pentobarb is also an option, probably would not be given in addition to all these. I don't see a lot of it in the ICUs, but it's certainly an option. Prophylactic anticonvulsants, Dilantin, just as a review, remember Dilantin needs to be given in normal saline. It will crystallize in D5W. Make sure you're familiar with Dilantin therapeutic levels being 10 to 20. Again, little review. Uh, Kepra, an anticonvulsant option as well. I mean, there's others, but those are common choices. Antipyretics, if the patient has a fever, as we talked about. And prophylactic uh, curling's ulcer prevention. Remember, curling's ulcer is the one we talked about in the burn segment, where the patients that are under a lot of stress will just develop these curling's ulcer, and these patients definitely need 
prophylactic. Let's talk about the complications. What is the worst case scenario? Well, we can skip over. Worst case scenario is if you see something called the Cushing's triad appear. Triad means three. So three of these signs will appear. An increase in the systolic blood pressure, a widening pulse pressure, and bradycardia. So what do you think that indicates? Cushing's triad indicates that there is pressure coming on down to the brain stem, coming on down to that cardiorespiratory center in the medulla. So when you see this happening, it is ominous, meaning there is no turning back to decrease the intracranial pressure. Another fourth sign you may see with Cushing's triad is bradypnea or respiratory slowing. So any one of these, you know, four, but in a triad, is possible and that is ominous, the worst sign. Of course, like we talked about, diabetes insipidus or a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone or SIADH. Remember, DI is when you have a suppression of antidiuretic hormone. Your problem is that the patient goes into a you know, hypovolemic shock state if it's not identified and the serum sodium is gonna be very elevated. Whereas with SIADH, there is a hypersecretion of antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary, and what you get is a diluted sodium, so a dilutional hyponatremia, because water is reabsorbed into the vascular space. The last thing is something called cerebral salt wasting, and cerebral salt wasting is similar to SIADH in that you do lose serum sodium, but what you also lose is intravascular volume or fluid. So with the intravascular fluid, you lose the sodium. So that's how it's distinguished from SIADH, which is just um, inappropriate release of ADH.